Okay, great. Are we officially ready to go then? <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Diane Cruz. I'm the CEO of NeoConnect. We are a consulting firm that has been wor working with several of the communities in the Iron Range on a broadband plan. And the purpose of our discussion today is to talk about the findings of the plan, uh, talk about the capital costs, why this is important, what are some strategies that uh, could be considered, um, is it a financially sustainable model if we built a gigabit type network? Um, so I will hopefully dive into all of those details today. Um, Doug and Carl, uh, we have about an hour, is that right? Yeah, I think we have blocked off even until noon if we need it, but obviously okay. if an hour's fine. Yeah. Okay, well, and I would love for you all to ask any questions as I go. So if you have questions that come up, please feel free to maybe raise your hand. Carl, maybe you can help me with that. Um, sometimes it's hard for me to multitask and see everybody. Um, but if there are people that want to ask any questions while I'm going through the presentation, please feel free to have this be a two-way conversation. Um, so with that, I will share my screen. And... I think if I share this, I can share everything that I've got open. Okay, are you all seeing my, my screen? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so um, the, the study incorporates all of the, what was four and now three school districts in the Laurentian, uh, East Range and Tower areas. Uh, the purpose of our discussion today will be talking specifically towards the Masabi East School District and what our findings have been for that school district. And what I'd like to talk today about is why are local governments investing in broadband? I think that's the obvious, especially with the pandemic. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what the pandemic has taught us and what the existing services and providers are and where there's the most need. And then we'll talk about some uh, models for gigabit strategies. So gigabit is a thousand megabits per second, both upload and download. The current FCC definition for broadband is 25 by three. So this is a huge um, improvement over maybe the minimum standard that the FCC has defined broadband. The state of Minnesota has raised the bar a bit where they've defined um, served as meeting a minimum of 100 megabits per second in download and 20 megabits per second in upload. But the network that we are proposing is um, leapfrogging that technology and provides a thousand megabits or a gigabit worth of network um, capacity, both upload and download. So we'll talk about um, the capital costs of that type of network, as well as some strategies to reduce the cost and seek funding and so forth. So why is this important and why are local governments investing in broadband? And I, I think I don't really need to spend a lot of time on this, but what we're seeing is that the internet is everything, especially given the pandemic. Our homes are currently uh, the places where we are having our kids attend school or maybe we are doing workforce training. Um, it's where we're working and it's now our medical clinics. So having an internet to be able to internet connection that is capable of supporting uh, Zoom calls and video traffic and all of the applications that we're seeing that we're doing from home is now critical. It's our connection to the outside world. But just to give you a perspective of what has happened over the past uh, 20 years or so, back in 1992, the global internet traffic was 100 gigabits per day. And if you flash forward to 2021, we're now seeing 105 gigabits per second is the worldwide traffic. And that has increased by 92% since the pandemic. So uh, what we're seeing is um, traffic is now much more video rich and content rich. Um, people are sharing pictures 
and immersive video is something that Facebook is testing, virtual reality. You know, we're going to have Star Wars <laughs> within the next couple of, of years where um, we will actually, you know, have ultra high definition video. And it just, that takes up a lot of bandwidth. So that's what's happening. And then on top of that, not only are we seeing more content rich uh, traffic on the internet from our homes, but now we have a number of things that are attached to the internet. So think of refrigerators and our thermostats and nests where you can remotely control all of these different devices that have a connection to the internet, medical monitoring devices, um, robot. What is soon coming within the next five years is self-driving cars and self-driving trucks. Um, self-driving trucks are being um, implemented in Europe today where the lead car is actually manned, but then all of the um, trucks behind it, 20 trucks behind it are uh, self-driving trucks. So this technology is being tested around the world and it will become available within the next five years um, ubiquitously. And so this is also something that is connected to the internet. So in order to effectively work, you need to have really robust infrastructure. So that's what's coming. That's why it's important. And local governments are investing in broadband because the private sector has not invested in broadband infrastructure, especially for areas that are rural where the costs are really high and the business case is not there to make a good adequate return on investment. So um, we're seeing local governments in order to stay vital, at, keep their communities vital and vibrant, they're investing in, in this um, infrastructure. This is very important. Any questions so far? Keep going, okay. The other reason why um, governments are investing in broadband is um, during this administration, the net neutrality laws were overturned, which just basically, um, I don't know if I wanna get into this too much, but it's just basically the internet um, is, is threatened to be no longer free and open to everyone. So the internet is just such an incredible um, equalizer because it's open, it's free, um, you can push content. And um, during this administration, those net neutrality, neutrality laws were overturned. And the concern is that a few companies will control what is on the internet. So a lot of local governments, the state governments are putting in um, additional controls to restore net neutrality laws for their state. <clears throat> but also, as we know, the internet is a driver of economic development. Well, what has the pandemic taught us? So the pandemic has taught us that we really do need to shoot for gigabit services to our homes, because as I mentioned, our homes are our workplace, our education centers, our medical clinics, really everything else is happening um, while we're at home. One month after the pandemic hit, the residential internet usage increased 92% in the United States. And two thirds of workers, according to a study that was just published within the last week, uh, want to continue working from home after things return to normal after the pandemic. So I think um, this is here to stay. It's not this idea of working from home is uh, probably going to continue. And so what we're seeing is there's a, a migration of workers that are moving to more remote and rural areas to live because they've discovered that they can work anywhere. And so why not work in a really beautiful place like Lake Country or in the mountains or anywhere where there's a beautiful natural amenity uh, where they can raise their kids and enjoy peace and quiet and uh, live in a beautiful place. So I know that from our committee meetings that there has been a migration of people to the Iron Range area as well, that people want to live there and, um, and they can live there as long as you have adequate internet service. So this is why this is so important and this is why this is a relevant conversation. And now as we talk about what services are in place, we can see where there's the most need. 
Uh, I am planning to be in Minnesota the week of November 9th, and we are planning to release the report um, that week as well. But in the report, there will be a lot of valuable information that I hope that you all use um, as you're putting together your strategies for improving broadband. So the first part of the report, section one, we'll talk about the existing services and needs where there's the most needs, uh, where there's areas that could potentially be priority areas because there's a higher level of density and a good business case to make happen. Um, section two are all of the capital costs and the financial capability and the modeling. Um, I'd love to hear from you all if you want me to do some specific modeling for your communities or uh, put together a several what-if scenarios. Our financial models are flexible enough that we can plug in a couple of key assumptions and we can give you the financial feasibility results. So after this meeting and perhaps the week before the week of uh, November 9th, if you'd like me to do some additional modeling and what if scenarios for your communities, I would be more than happy to do that. And uh, then we can schedule a follow-up meeting for when I'm in the Minnesota area the week of November 9th. And then the third section will be policies that could be implemented today. I know that many of the communities have implemented dig once policies and some of the other policies that help reduce the cost of broadband infrastructure deployment. So in addition to a description of those policies, we'll also provide sample language of what those policies and ordinances can look like. And you can simply adopt those um, within your community if you haven't done so already. But then we'll talk about what other approaches have been used by other governments. Uh, what, what could a public, um, public-private partnership look like uh, to help improve broadband? Uh, what have other local governments done and what does uh, the contractual arrangement look like for other governments that have done this? So hopefully the report will be a great tool for you to use as a reference as you're implementing your broadband roadmap. So the current assessment. So the areas that are shaded in green are served. And the areas that are in kind of a lighter maroon, purple are underserved. And underserved are uh, less than 100 by 20 megabits per second. And then the remaining portion of the area are unserved, meaning they have less than 25 by 3 megabits per second in service. And um, this also shows the outline of the study area. And then obviously we are going to focus down in you know, this, this area. Oops. Uh, we're going to focus on the Wasabi uh, school, district. school District. So one thing uh, that we've also done is uh, the FCC maps are notoriously flawed because um, the service providers self-report their advertised needs on a quarterly basis to the FCC. And so if one building within a census block is quote served, meaning there's more than 25 by three megabits per second, then they can claim that the entire census block and all of the households in the census block are served. And so the data is flawed and um, this has been kind of a national conversation. We know that the data is incorrect. And so in parallel to the NeoConnect study, Geo Partners was uh, brought on board on a statewide basis to conduct speed tests to gather real um, actual um, capabilities of the existing network infrastructure. And I don't think Glenn is on the call today. Is, is Glenn on our call? Okay, um, I'm going to kind of share some of the information that Geo Partners has put together. Um, and then I can certainly send out um, more information you can access the data and get um, more granular um, into the information that they put together, but it's a statewide assessment of what actual speed test data looks like with the hope of um, gathering enough information so that if 
local governments or service providers would like to apply for grant funding, uh, they can refute the existing FCC data maps that show that the area is served. So the reason why that's such a big deal is the federal programs and the state programs have an eligibility mark where if the area is served, then it's not eligible for funding. And so unfortunately, because this, the information is incorrect, it eliminates those areas for potential grants. So um, conducting a statewide speed test assessment will hopefully be able to refute some of that information if it's incorrect and make this area eligible for a grant funding. So I included um, where uh, a link to some of the speed test information, and I can share this after our meeting today. But in addition to the statewide speed test assessment, Geo Partners has also put together several wireless options and pricing for that, um, as well as a design. And I would like to say that if there are areas within the study area that don't have broadband service, wireless is a really good short-term solution because it takes a while to, number one, get funding for a fiber network, but then number two, it takes a while to actually build it. So many communities are looking at wireless as a short-term solution where you can use your existing powers or maybe you could use your existing anchor institutions like your schools, your hospitals, your government locations to put up wireless antennas that would provide a short-term fix. Now, wireless is a little bit um, flawed in that, you know, we're seeing the trend towards needing more and more bandwidth and wireless is limited to the amount of bandwidth that it can support. But also wireless is, um, if it's unlicensed spectrum, especially, it's uh, limited by line of sight, meaning you have to be able to see the towers. So in the spring, when the trees fill out, suddenly your wireless network doesn't work. Or if it's raining and the weather's bad, um, wireless is has got some shortcomings. But it's a good short-term solution, especially for areas that have no broadband service. And so I would highly encourage you to take a look at what GeoPartners has put together in terms of a wireless solution. <clears throat> we did look at areas where there's some possible priority areas that you could look at. So within um, this school district, there were three areas that we pinpointed that are unserved and underserved, but they have a sufficient amounts of density. So because there's sufficient amounts of density, it's a pretty easy business case to make work. And so I'll scroll in on this a little bit. Um, these are the areas that uh, I think that you could talk to the existing service providers and we have a financial model to show that they're financially feasible. Um, like for example, Zito Media has built out fiber in some of the areas within the school district and they are very open to working with the local communities to help improve broadband, maybe apply for grant funding. And these are three priority areas where there's a lot of density and the business plan works. So perhaps um, those might be good uh, low hanging fruit areas where you could talk to the providers about a building from fiber to the home. <clears throat> Here's a better map that shows where the households are located. So again, I'm gonna zoom in. Um, we were able to identify household parcels and identify whether or not there was a building on those parcels. <clears throat> so again, there's a lot of density and maybe you can't see the households as much um, behind the shaded area, but for example, South of McKinley, there's a lot of density of homes there. Um, near Embarrass Lake and Escogama Lake, there's a lot of density of homes. So these might be good areas to pinpoint working with the existing providers on putting together a project. 
<laughs> any questions so far? Uh, Diana, that last map, can you explain what the different color dots mean? Hmm. No, <laughs> not really. <laughs> well, I can't. Um, so I think the blue dots are businesses. Okay. And um, the yellow and kind of greenish dots are served versus unserved households okay. or underserved households. So the, um, the green are unserved, the orange are underserved. But I have more detail on that um, on, on some of the reports that we put together, the, the spread that we put together. Sure. But the other colors are, are also, um, we had to dig in a little bit deeper because the GIS data that we had didn't state whether or not there was a home on that parcel. I think there are some co different colored dots that are parcel where there isn't a home established on that lot yet. Does that help? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I went back and forth with my engineering team on this. It's like, okay, what do these dots mean? <laughs> Um, okay, so what are the best practices and what are we looking for? So I mentioned uh, gigabit, so a thousand by a thousand um, for a gigabit worth of service. Uh, typically around the country, we're seeing 60 to $100 per month for residential customers. Uh, when we did the survey for the area, there was a lot of support of people saying they would subscribe to a gigabit with a worth of service and pay between 100 and 150 dollars a month, and um, I think that also speaks to the fact, especially after the pandemic, that people will pay a little bit more for really great service. Um, so when we did our financial modeling, we used some of the statistics from the survey. I think 25% stated that they would subscribe to the highest level of service available and, and pay between the range of $100 and $150 a month. Typically for businesses um, to get a dedicated gigabit service, uh, the pricing is usually in the $500 to $750 range for businesses. Um, the reason why these networks are not being built is you know, ubiquitously is because um, they just are very expensive. But I often, hate, and I think I said this during our last meeting, that um, the problems that you can't solve with money are the tough ones. Problems that you can solve with money are really not a problem. So the good news is that uh, we've identified roughly how much it would cost to build out within the study area. And we've done modeling around um, you know, if we applied for grant funding or if it was subsidized or if there was a way to pay for it that the um, end users paid an additional fee, which the survey supports they would be um, in support of, you can build this network in a, in a financially feasible way. The, the biggest issue around the financial modeling is just making sure that you have enough revenue to cover your debt. And so the reasons why these projects fail, if you will, and are not sustainable is they don't have enough revenue or there haven't been strategies to address debt mitigation. We have to look at um, that as a, a key driver of the financial model. So Diane, <clears throat> Diane, this is Doug, a uh, question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So just, I'm curious about, there's apparently a differentiation then in rates between the rates that would be offered to business customers as opposed to residential customers. And I know in a contact with Zito, they were asking for business customers. <clears throat> and uh, just wondering, we have a lot of small businesses, uh, you know, on, in the East Range area that uh, don't sort of conjure up the image of a large employee business uh, entities, uh, would you would you picture that Zito and other providers would demand such a premium for very small businesses? Probably not. Um, so usually there's you know maybe a threshold of the number of employees 
it, it's a it's a hard thing to define because sometimes you could have a small five person business that maybe is creating films and uploading films and is needing more bandwidth, if you will, than a shared technology. Um, so it's, it's hard to come up with the definition of what is a small business versus what's a, a regular business. But um, the difference in pricing is dedicated bandwidth versus shared bandwidth. So a gigabit worth of service is a lot of um, bandwidth and the 100 to $150 range is using shared technology where there might be um, a neighborhood of 16 homes that share um, a gigabit or there might be 32 homes that share a gigabit and a small business could be part of that. A dedicated service of 500 to $750 a month is for something like an anchor institution, like a school or a government um, facility or a large business establishment that would want a dedicated pipe of a gigabit service. So that's usually the differentiator. It's usually driven by the business. And there's usually flexibility from the providers. I think they know that, say a small consulting firm that doesn't use the internet that much might pay 100 to $150 a month for shared gigabit technology. Does that make sense? Um, we'll get into the models a little bit in this conversation, but um, the county and township involvement in ownership and capital contribution are all negotiable. So we can talk about what other com communities have done but what we've seen in Minnesota is that very little is required from a financial commitment from the townships for the service providers to implement fiber to the home. But in areas where maybe we can't make the financial model work, there might be some strategies where the township or the citizens contribute additional money towards making the model more financially sustainable. We'll talk about that in a second though. So I wanna review the capital cost assumptions um, and what we were looking at in terms of what it would cost to build fiber to the, to the home. And this will be provided um, in the report, but I kind of wanted to walk, walk you through it. And then maybe you can it can spark some ideas of uh, creating what if scenarios for the modeling in our follow up meetings. So, in the um, Masabi East School District, most of the town of Aurora is served. Uh, the city, most of the city within Bawabic is served, and Colvin, Hoyt Lakes, White, and a good portion of the Whiteface um, Reservation are all served where they are showing that they're receiving greater than 100 by 20 megabits per second. And the first line is the number of homes or parcels. <clears throat> so maybe take an eyeball look at this. We did do the capital costs of what if we were to overbuild these areas with fiber to the premise. Uh, we have the number of households, the, the plant miles, we assumed everything was going to be underground construction. Um, your cost to deploy fiber using the existing utility poles is less expensive, but there's a trade-off in that they're more difficult to operate. There's more outages, if you will, if you deploy in an aerial fashion, but um, it is less expensive, so there's a trade-off. So the costs that I'm providing are really worst case scenario where we're assuming 100% of the construction would be underground construction. And then uh, we have the density of households per mile. And so that's a good indicator and a key factor for the service providers as they're looking at um, deploying fiber to the premise, they'll be looking at density per mile. Um, go up here. 
And then another big variable that we've kind of gone back and forth with the service providers on is right for one set of assumptions, we assumed that we would have to include a pretty expensive rock adder to the underground construction. Because we're in the iron range, there is really dense rock. Uh, it can be sometimes a get, I got you, if you will, in your capital cost assumptions. We did do a scenario where we assumed a 25% of the route miles would have very dense rock. And the feedback that we got from uh, many of the service providers is that's probably too high of an, an assumption. So we ran the numbers both with a 25% rock adder as well as a 0% rock adder. So that gives us a range, a really good range of the cost for deploying fiber to the premise would be between this amount and this amount for this area. So if we were to overbuild the existing areas that are served, the top line here are your project costs all in with the 25% rock adder. And then below that, you know, we break that out by what are your costs for engineering to do your final design and engineering? What is the underground labor for the cost of fiber to be deployed? Technical services is just splicing the fiber and more the fine tune work of getting the network to be built together. Uh, Sometimes local governments will just build the fiber network. So they would be looking at this line item for costs and then they could negotiate with the service providers to pay for the customer premise labor and installation. So that includes the fiber from say a vault or pedestal on the road into their home or so across their private land into their home, installing the, the equipment on the outside of the home and then splicing and testing and turning, turning up that service. So in some cases, the local government has paid for the underground labor construction and then the service provider has paid for everything else. So that's why we're breaking out the costs in this way. Um, so these are the costs for the 25% rock adder. And then below that are the costs without the rock adder. So for example, in Aurora, if we can build the network in a way that we're not hitting dense rock to build out to the, um, all of the homes that are currently served, it would be a range between 3.2 million and 4.6. And we can further refine these estimates in working with the service providers and or working with the local governments. Um, but because we haven't done an on-site survey, we haven't done final design and engineering, we would need to refine our assumptions <clears throat> on this, but this is a good range. Um, there are some areas uh, that are underserved. Um, so that's these areas here. So we carved out the areas that are served and then um, within the city, there are some areas, for example, in Bowabic that are underserved. So we identified 121 parcels within the city that are underserved. And then in the Bowabic township, um, there's 97 homes that are outside of the city limits, but within the township um, that are un underserved. And then let me go this way. We also identified those three priority areas that have a good mix of unserved and underserved, but have a higher density of homes per mile. So for example, the density of homes per mile for these areas um, you know, like the White Face Reservoir or Reservation, five homes per mile is really low density. It, it will be very, very hard to come up with a business plan to serve those locations. That's where maybe a wireless solution would be a good um, 
a good idea to deploy for those locations. There's probably good density here um, for the underserved and unserved areas out within the city limits of the Wabak. And then these are the priority areas in terms of density of homes per mile. And then again, below that are all of the assumptions and then the range of capital cost estimates. So I mentioned that these priority areas, we've got a good financial model to make this work. So we totaled up what the capital cost would be to just build to those priority areas and then assumed a 50% grant. And we plugged in the range of that versus um, without rock adder. So, um, $5 million to build out to those three priority areas and we would hit a pretty um, good level of households. So the number of households that we would be able to serve would be 768 households within those three priority areas. <laughs> and I'm sorry, this is kind of tedious. So um, you can raise your hand if this is just extremely boring. But I want to show you the financial model. We won't dive into the details, but again, we can create some what-if scenarios. This is a really detailed model where we can plug in all of the key assumptions for the model. All of the cells that are highlighted are input cells. And um, we have one page of input cells. And so again, we can create a number of different scenarios. We assumed a 40% take rate or a 40% market share that would be split um, at, after two years of building out the network. So 20% in the first year and then an additional 20% in the second year. And then we Usually we sit down with the service providers and we make all of the assumptions in terms of um, what type of services would be offered at what pricing. Um, this is right in line with our survey results where 25% said they would pay for a higher price gigabit service between $100 and $150 a month. 35% said they would sign up for 250 megabits per second for around $80 a month. And then 40% of the survey respondents said they would choose the 100 megabits per second product at $60 a month. So we plugged in the same numbers into the model. And we also put in the pricing of those services. That's what these are here. And then it miraculously spits out the, the financial um, metrics of the model, the balance sheet and cash flow and PL statements. But I mentioned that debt is really important <clears throat> to look at and making sure you have enough revenue to cover your debt service. And so a lot of the financial feasibility um, ratios that we look at, look at are around, do we have enough revenue to make our principal and interest payments on the debt. So with this, we assumed 50% would be covered by a grant and 50% would be debt financed. And um, we're losing 103,000 the first year of operations. We start making money the second year. This is our cumulative losses or how much money uh, we would have in the, in the bank, if you will. And then this is a number that we look at in terms of our, our debt coverage. So that number we want to see over 200%, which means that we have um, enough revenue to cover our debt and that that ratio should be greater than 200%. And so, you know, the, the model works, but it's not great. Um, there might be some strategies to help mitigate or share in that debt risk with the service provider. Um, and then we have yeah. asking what, what interest rate you're using, look like it's 4% there. 4% interest rate. Yep. What is the question on that? It was just what, what the interest rate is, but. Okay, yeah, yeah we assumed a 4% interest rate, 
which I think is typical that the service providers are able to get maybe even lower than that if they're um, using the USDA RUS program. Uh, we look if we could fund additional tranches or um, if we could fund additional phases. And in order to fund additional phases, a bank typically needs to see 125% coverage ratio. And so the question is that after build out and after receiving 40% take rate, they could fund additional expansion and easily go to the bank and get additional funding. So that is a yes, if you will, that the network is sustainable enough to fund additional phases. Um, and then we, we look at our cumulative cash flows over 10 years and we make sure that after 10 years, our cumulative cash flows are greater than our debt. And the cumulative cash flows for this project is 1.8 million and the debt um, after 10 years is 1.7. So again, that's kind of close, but the answer is yes, it's feasible. And then we look for positive EBITDA and um, EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. It's kind of a term that a lot of providers will look at in terms of whether this could be a viable project to eventually sell. <clears throat> and the answer to that question is yes, it's, we have positive EBITDA. Now, a 40% take rate is probably pretty um, low. And so again, this is kind of worst case scenario. Um, what we're seeing in rural parts of the country, especially, is that the take rate percentages are in the 60 to 80% range of market share. So um, we can model those numbers as well in the financial model. And then it has uh, in addition to all of the feasibility objectives, it's, we've got you know, income statements, um, balance sheet and cash flow. So it's a really great tool to be able to use when you're talking to the service provider. And so we would be more than happy to model a number of what if scenarios and um, help you in those discussions with the service providers. Uh, Diane, question in the chat. Does this include backhaul and CPE costs? Yes. Yep. So one thing I wanted, that's a great point. <clears throat> so another thing I wanted to point out then is um, that NESC has built out fiber in the study area that would that could potentially reduce the capital costs significantly. Um, just for this school district, um, the capital costs could be reduced by about 6 million because the Northeast Service Cooperative has built out fiber you know, pretty extensively in the area. And when we were talking with, for example, CTC, CTC, um, sorry, CTC would um, typically use NESC's network and build out um, from there uh, because they can save a, a large amount of, of the backhaul costs. So this is roughly what we're seeing in terms of savings for the highlighted areas or the areas within the school district that we're talking about today. And then I have a, a map of NESC's network in the area. So you can see they've, they've built out pretty significantly in the iron range. So again, that, that kind of also highlights uh, the three priority areas that we were showing um, because uh, there's existing fiber, you know, pretty close to those priority areas that um, the NESC network could be used for backhaul. And John, I know John's on the call. Um, John, um, I don't want to call you out, but if you're still on the call, do you want to talk a little bit about areas where you're looking to expand the network through the EDA grant? Sure. Um, 
One thing that we're looking at doing, we've got an application into the US EDA and a large portion of that grant is for us to build a couple of diverse redundant backhaul segments that'll get us to direct connectivity to wholesale internet providers. And the benefit for the region in that would be quite an increase in broadband capacity. Um, those areas that we're looking at building, um, we have two routes, one that goes Willow River to Cambridge and another that goes Barnum to Aiken. Um, what we'd also look at doing with those segments is also allowing other carriers and service providers to access them to either upgrade their current backhaul capacity or new ones to come into the region and um, do uh, last mile services to the private sector. That's great. <clears throat> right, so that would also reduce their costs, their monthly costs for backhaul. And often that is one of the most expensive um, items on a service provider's operating expense budget is the backhaul and internet feed to get to internet hubs, or we often ref refer to them as internet supply, if you will. Just like a, a water system needs an abundant water supply, same goes for internet. We need to get to internet hubs and typically providers will lease that circuit and it's usually on a per mile basis for the cost. And so to serve these rural areas, it even um, makes it more difficult to serve the areas because those backhaul expenses are high. So what NESC is doing in, in building a redundant fiber network to these internet hubs is they're not only providing more bandwidth to rural areas, but they're also reducing a huge expense for the service providers. So it's a win-win all around. Thank you, John. Okay, let's see. Let's head back to the presentation. And <clears throat> so the, the question is, is this feasible? Are, are you seeing also the, the um, Zoom portion of what I'm seeing? Sh should I move this so you can see the presentation a little bit better? Okay, there. You can see it. So yeah, you're good, okay. Is it feasible for the service provider? And the answer is yes. Um, so for example, for those three priority areas that we model with a 40% take rate and a 50% grant, it's feasible. Most likely we would get a higher percentage of take rate. And so then yes, definitely it would be feasible. Um, we, we did not include the improvement of use of the NESC fiber um, but that would also improve the model even more so. Um, I know that NESC would either provide it on an IRU basis or a monthly um, lease cost, so we would need to model that. But um, that should reduce the costs even more significantly and therefore make the financial model, model even stronger. But as I mentioned, we are more than happy to create a number of scenarios to evaluate. So your homework assignment, if you will, is to come up with what you would like to see as a township leader or as um, a school district or as you know, the East Range Powers Board. What, what type of scenarios would you like us to model and provide that feedback to me and Carl and um, we can model that and we'd be more than happy to sit down with you the week of the ninth when I'm in town. So what are, are the options? So the communities in Minnesota have done a really good job of partnering with the service providers. And in many cases, the service providers have implemented their network um, expansion and applied for grant funding without very much capital requirement from the cities or the townships or the county. And so um, we'll talk a little bit about some of our success stories in Minnesota. Um, during the study, Paul Bunyan 
submitted a Minnesota border to border grant application for Worry, Sandy and Pike townships. So that's a huge win that has come out of this study. What the townships uh, provided to Paul Bunyan was 1% of the capital costs in a capital um, you know, match, if you will. And they also provided letters of support. We provided the survey results to Paul Bunyan. Um, we kept the address information confidential in terms of who responded to the survey, but we provided information in terms of what would people typically subscribe to for services, what would they be willing to pay for a gigabit pipe and uh, some of the information around um, you know, feedback from the survey results. Um, those were provided to Paul Bunyan for their grant application. And John talked a little bit about their application uh, to the EDA program to expand their middle mile fiber. Um, I think that that may have happened with or without us, but uh, that happened during the study as well. EDA had a program in response to COVID for broadband infrastructure and EDA continues to be a good uh, program to target for uh, adding on and expanding your existing broadband infrastructure. One difference with the EDA program versus some of the other federal programs is that EDA does not eliminate an area that is already served. So they don't have the threshold requirements of served and unserved that many of the other funding programs have. So it's a great way to expand middle mile fiber. It's a great way to expand fiber to critical anchor institutions like towers or schools or um, business parks, Main Street. Uh, that program has been used by a number of clients to expand broadband capabilities. And they have a program that's outside of the COVID-19 program um, in response to the COVID-19 uh, you know, pandemic. They, there was an additional $1.5 billion that was available, but they have a normal program that funds broadband infrastructure as well. CTC last year was awarded a grant through the FCC's reconnect program to build out fiber to the premise within the Cherry townships and parts of the Scott township last year. So that was a great uh, success story that came out of our previous study in working with the Iron Range. And <clears throat> there's another program called the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund or the RDOF program. And it's right, it's underway as we speak. Um, a number of service providers that have network in Minnesota have passed the first threshold of becoming an eligible applicant to this program. So uh, Vito, Paul Bunyan, Arbig, and CTC have all um, been certified as an applicant to this program. And this program is a reverse auction where uh, $20.4 billion will be provided in grant funding to build out infrastructure to areas that are completely unserved. And um, there's a lot of rules around what these service providers can disclose in terms of where they are planning to apply. Um, they're not allowed to provide that information. There's very strict rules around that. And so, um, that program will become underway. The reverse bidding starts October 29th, so this week, and they'll continue to um, participate in the auction until all of the funding has been exhausted or, or allocated. And um, it's thought that that bidding process will continue through the middle of November. And so hopefully, after the first two weeks of November, we may have a good idea of what other areas uh, may be built out using the RDOF program. But we don't wanna 
jeopardize anybody's ability to uh, access that funding. And so, you know, we don't have any information in terms of where these companies are planning to apply for funding, but that's a really great program that's underway as we speak. And hopefully we'll have some more information by the middle of November in terms of whether or not uh, some of the areas within our study area have been awarded grant funding through this program. Uh, another federal program that was just recently announced is the Community Connect program. <clears throat> that has a threshold of eligibility of 10 by one megabits per second or less. And so there are very uh, limited areas within the study area that would be eligible for that funding. The GeoPartners uh, website information has really great information about where those households are located that would be eligible for this program. And so I would encourage you to take a look at what GeoPartners has put together because it's a really great tool that shows areas that are um, eligible for the RDOF program, areas that are eligible for the Community Connect program. And then uh, we also anticipate that there will be additional stimulus funds that are available at the federal level in response to COVID-19, most likely announced um, later this year or the beginning of next year, uh, most likely after the election. But the HERO Act that has been discussed in Congress um, has earmarked anywhere from 50 to $80 billion in grant funding for broadband. And so we do anticipate that there will be federal programs that will be announced within the next year. <clears throat> What's really important is to have a project that's shovel ready so that you can apply for some of this funding that we anticipate will be announced within the next year. So again, your homework is to uh, give me uh, some areas and what if scenarios that uh, we could further model so that this is even more meaningful for you, if you will. Um, and uh, hopefully give that information to me within the next week or so, so that we can plug in some numbers and we'd be more than happy to meet with you the week of November 9th when, when we're in town. Um, I mentioned the report will be also uh, uh, released that week. <clears throat> and that's a good go-to source uh, for examples of what other local governments have done. Um, but in addition to the report, we provide a number of other deliverables as a part of this study. So we'll provide samples of policies and ordinances that you could adopt that are broadband friendly, that reduce the cost of broadband infrastructure. Uh, we'll provide maps, we'll provide um, all of our capital cost estimates in great detail. You can use those for um, issuing requests for proposals or bids to build the network. Um, we'll provide the results of our financial modeling. Um, and there's a, a lot of information that we provide as deliverables um, of the study in addition to the report that we're finalizing currently. So that's a lot of information. Um, I thank you for sitting through this. I know that um, many of us have Zoom fatigue, but what questions do you all have? And I'll stop sharing my screen. Any questions from the group? Uh, Diane, <clears throat> Diane, this is Doug. Um, just, uh, I seem to recall in some of the previous LTE meetings, that you were pretty confidently pointing out that real property values of uh, premises that are served with the gigabyte services actually have a discernible added market value. Is that correct? Yeah, so the question is, um, is there an improvement in your market value of your house if you have built out a fiber network? Is that roughly the question? Yeah, particularly gigabyte service. Yeah, exactly. So the, the Fiber Broadband Association has done a number of studies that um, have looked at the increase in home values if a fiber network has been installed within the community. 
And the results of those studies have shown that the impact of fiber on housing values increases the house value by 3%. If that fiber is providing gigabit services, the average increase in home value is 7%. And so that might be a way of uh, easing the burden, if you will, of building out fiber. Uh, not only is it a great uh, investment from an economic development standpoint, but it also increases the value of the homes. I would bet that that is even greater post pandemic because again, what we're seeing is people are realized they, they can work anywhere and they want to live in areas that are more rural and beautiful and um, have a great community. And so I would bet that the home value um, improvement post pandemic is probably even greater than 7%. It's a good question, Doug. Thank you. And, and Whitney, um, I see that you're on the call. Um, there was recently a survey that real estate, the real estate industry um, put out about the, what's important in terms of selecting a home. And uh, they found that broadband is a, a key critical component of selecting a home. Do you wanna talk a little bit more about that survey that was done recently? Uh, sure, it was, it was a real, um, it was, we hired, the agency hired somebody to go out and interview about 25 different realtors across Northeastern Minnesota. And it was basically, we kind of, we all kind of think we know what they're going to say, but what that study did was it affirmed, right? It, it told, it confirmed to us that broadband is a critical component to the real estate market. And we need to be thinking about that in our rural areas if we want to attract and retain people and businesses to the, to the region. Thank you. Mm-hmm. What other questions? I guess I just would wanna throw it out there to think a little bit about what is that next step on the East Range? Where is that air target area that the East Range is gonna focus in on and really try to engage with a provider, whether it be CTC or Zito or even, a, I, I don't know if you have a Mediacom potential out there. You know, how do you, how do you take this information and get to the next step instead of just putting it on the shelf? So <laughs> it's not a challenge that you strange to be thinking about that. Is that a rhetorical question or do you want somebody to respond? <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it, it's hard. It's, it's a lot of information. There's a lot of opportunities, um, but you have to start somewhere, right? And it looked like some of those priority areas that you laid out, Diane, it, it might be really interesting if the, the, if the elected officials in those priority areas really wanted to take a look and see if we can't identify some federal grant funding resources along with our local resources to potentially put a project together. I agree. Yeah. I think we'll, oh, go ahead, Carl. I was just gonna say, it looked like we might have something that straddles both the city of Bawabic and Bawabic Township. So it might be worth getting those two together at some point here and figuring out what the next steps are there. I think that's a good idea. So I think um, what we're seeing across the country is that the squeaky wheel gets the grease, gets the oil. And so um, the next steps really would be to maybe look at those priority areas and then the households that are just out there within the city, but un unserved. Um, we could probably put a, a project together with those four areas. So it's, um, let me pull this up again. So it would be the, um, the 
area uh, within the city that is currently underserved, so 121 households there, and then the three priority areas, I think that we could easily put together a project to expand um, the existing footprint that either Mediacom has or Zito Media. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's just under a thousand homes that would make a huge impact. And then meet with these providers, you know, encourage them to apply for grant funding, you know, provide resources. We've, we've basically in the study have given them everything that they would need to apply for a grant. So that includes um, statistically valid um, random sample size and surveys. They typically need that for a grant application. That is an outcome of the study. Uh, all of these identified areas and maps and households that don't have service and capital cost estimates for putting that together in financial modeling. So what's coming from the study is really anything and everything that a provider would need to apply for grant funding. So I would just encourage you to, you know, we'd be happy to sit down with you with the service providers. Um, you know, we can, we've done a lot of research and outreach to these providers already. And so this is not new to them. They're, they know that we're doing this study. Um, we, they know that we've identified uh, priority areas. I think that what would help our case is if the local leaders and stakeholders would also participate in these uh, meetings with providers, talk about your support and, and how can we put this together? Yes, this is a financially feasible process, um, how can we support you in putting together funding to get this built out? So I would encourage that those would be the, the next steps. Maybe look at putting together um, some projects that you would like to see built out. So Diana, question? As sure. said, um, just to clarify again, in this particular data chart, what factors are taken into consideration to differentiate between served, underserved, and unserved? Uh, um, in other words, why the green, the red, and the blue? So the green areas are served. So most of those would not be eligible for grant funding. But if they have not built out fiber to the premise in those areas, a service provider might consider that because they have a lot of density, but they're already served, so they would not be able to get grant funding. <clears throat> the areas that are shown in pink would be eligible for the Minnesota Border to Border Grant Program that has the threshold of 100 by 20 megabits per second. So they're in pink because there's a mix of both unserved and underserved. And then the areas that are in blue are priority areas where they are unserved and underserved. They would be eligible, for example, for the Minnesota Border to Border Grant Program. And they have a higher um, household density and maybe good uh, low hanging fruit, if you will, for building out um, a network. So that's what the different colors are, are showing. Diane, did you come across any information? Because I know over on the East Range, we have Lake Connections, which is now Zito. And we they, they serve some, but they don't serve all. So I'm wondering if, say, Doug in the city of Aurora is sitting, sitting there going, wait a second, I know people that want better service but Zito's not serving them yet. And so is that kind of where you're, you're kind of going there, Doug, or it's where yeah, I went? <laughs> definitely. To my knowledge, there are like two households in Aurora that have actual fiber to the premises uh, services. Zito has an extensive trunk line uh, fiber network uh, that couples with the NESC, um, you know, network that goes into the uh, public buildings uh, but served seems to be a pretty loose uh, characterization of what what uh, the status of the city of Aurora is, as far as I know. Anyway. 
Yeah, so Doug, what we could do there, so that this is how this is helpful for you, is yes, it's questionable on whether Aurora is served. Um, and so maybe we could look at what GeoPartners has put together in terms of speed test data. But we could also look at um, what would be the financial model for Zito to build out fiber to the premise within Aurora. And maybe we don't apply for grant funding for those areas, but we could model maybe building out in Aurora, Bawabek, and then some of these other, other areas. Um, and we could easily plug in these numbers then into the financial model to talk to Zito about building fiber to the premise. Yeah, I, I think we, we could rope in you know, White Township or at least parts of White, White Township into that too, because there's a part of White that basically bores straight into Aurora. So it's, so it's basically the street grid keeps going. Um, Is that yeah, the then, case in White Township too? They're considered served because late connections now Zito came through, but the number of connections are not what 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 would you would consider everyone. I would guess so, and if Ed Salon, I'm sure he could give more detail. But I think that was and, and Jody's on too, so I would defer to them. But I think that is probably the case. Ed, uh, Zito, or I mean, it was late connections at the time was supposed to serve the whole town of White. When they came through, they only came up to Highway 100 uh, from out on, on the south boundary of the town of White, and then they ran up into Aurora. And they built that building in Aurora over by the old Bradish Lumber Company for their, for their stuff to plug into. But uh, we still need to serve the other half of the township from Highway 100 over to the western boundaries in order to <clears throat> give the service to everybody. And that has come up before when we've been at township meetings out there. People have in turn uh, asked when they thought it, it was gonna happen, but so far you know, we got going on this project here, nothing has happened. Plus uh, scenic Ericers is considered, uh, is in the town of White also, and that's considered to be underserved. Uh, they said no, no major provider has ever gone out there. And, and all those people to see if they wanted to see served. So, and I'm sure they, that's that's a high end homes and stuff that are out there. And um, there used to be one business, but I believe it's gone now. Um, I'm sure they they would be interested in the uh, into the better quality internet. So. And some of that probably runs up right against the project areas we were looking at for the Boabic area. Yep. Like, so it's, it's around the same lake. Yeah. So we could we could take this information and you know put together several scenarios uh, to be able to begin the discussion with the providers to build out fiber to the premise. So I think you're right. These areas are shown that they're served. So right now they would not be eligible for grant funding, but there's probably a good business case to just build out fiber of the premise and not have it subsidized with grant funding. And we can model that. Okay. I have a question. And this might be, I know John Lufin's on here, but does Zito have separate lines running through the East Range or is it the Northeast Service Co-op lines that they utilize? The majority of their plant is their own. Uh, they've got a okay. few places where they they've accessed us at, uh, under an IRU, but for the most part, it's it's their plant. Okay. okay. As yeah, <laughs> it just makes the who's the the provider of choice for the East Range could vary based on the answer to that question. I think I don't know. Yeah, I'd be curious to see a full map of what Zito has actually built out. Good luck getting that. Uh, <laughs> we haven't had a lot of uh, had a lot of success, and uh, one of the things while we're out in the township was that we should just drive around and open up all the boxes and see if there's wire in there because apparently they put a bunch of tubes in the ground that they pull the cable through, but there's no cable. There's just the tubes that are there, so.
What other questions do you all have? Diane, Steve, can you hear me? I can, hi. Um, I just want to offer this uh, for these community leaders. Um, you know, whether you're served or unserved or underserved uh, isn't really the issue unless you're dependent upon grant dollars. If you can make a case that the community, that the citizens, that the businesses want high speed fiber, you know, that's the information providers want to hear. Um, we're fortunate that the IRRRB has allocated dollars. So, um, you know, you've got a grant or an opportunity there for some match funding. But in Itasca County, um, just recently, they've allocated $300,000 of their $5 million in CARES funding to both Arvig and Paul Bunyan for projects that are gonna connect some rural areas of Itasca County. St. Louis County got $24 million of CARES Act funding and isn't spending a nickel. They are cutting some roads, uh, some, some sides of the roads for broadband highways, they call it, but give me a break. That was only to prop up the loggers. But I would strongly encourage community leaders to call their county commissioner and start engaging them in a conversation that um, there's a need, there's a desire, and there's a way to do it. Because these providers, they're not all dependent on matches. They're just looking at the, um, the model. And if the numbers show that they can turn a profit in three to five years, they'll come in and do it. And Arvig is another company that uh, we can start considering up here because they've done a tremendous job in the state of Minnesota. Um, so I think we're missing out again by not having our county engaged in this process, but that's beholden upon you as city elected officials inviting them to the table. And I think uh, Commissioner McDonald is more receptive than other commissioners who will remain nameless. But, you know, they're not gonna, they're just not gonna walk in and offer something. You gotta ask them uh, to advocate for some support from the county. Steve, you're right. So um, what we could do with this information is put together a model um, to have a service provider uh, build out within the cities um, because I think that the number of households and the density is strong enough to support a model without subsidy, so without a grant. So we can certainly model that and uh, start a conversation with the providers. Um, but I really need your, your support in terms of a key stakeholder or community leader um, saying that you want this in your community as well. And I just wanted to comment that the 20% take rate the first two years to get to 40 is, you know, that's, that's I think it was over 70% in Cherry Township. Wow. Um, so, you know, again, where people are, especially in this Boabic Township, those three priority areas, uh, I would think they're clamoring um, for <laughs> viable option. So I think the take rate's well over 50%. Yeah, and we could model that too. Yeah. Yeah. So. <clears throat> I agree. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, I have sufficiently bombarded you with a lot of information. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, I think that um, 
I'm, I have to say I'm really excited because I think that there is a great opportunity to improve broadband infrastructure in the Iron Range. Uh, we've had a lot of support from the committee members and so I appreciate all of you uh, for your interest and time and commitment and uh, hopefully let's, let's do something to, to make it happen within the Iron Range. Hey, um, so if you'd like follow-up information, follow-up modeling, uh, reach out to uh, Carl and Whitney and myself, and we would be more than happy to put together a number of scenarios for you and uh, strategize, help you strategize on next steps to improve services within your community. Okay, with that, I'll turn it back to Doug. Right. Uh, just since we had a convened meeting of the East Range Joint Powers Board, uh, I'd uh, offer a motion to adjourn. Uh, Ed, are you still on? Yes, I am. Can we count on your support? Yes, you can. Yeah, all right. <laughs> and I'm not sure if uh, Mayor Wycombe's on yet. Is yes, that right? All right. Uh, 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 Sherry, could you do a roll call? You're muted, Sherry. All those in favor, Mayor Kipley? Yes. Uh, Mayor Wycom? Aye. And Mayor Gregor? Aye. The motion carries, the uh, meeting's adjourned. All right, thanks everyone. We'll be in touch on next steps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.